You're listening to the multiple award losing Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield, and I appreciate you coming with us once again. Unless you're new, then I don't like you at all. That's weird. You think you would like new people, too. I'm not a very nice person. Yeah, that is true. Uh, we've got a, a new episode and a new story for you today. It's going to be a uh, different than usual thing, though, because we are... Do we tell them? Uh, yeah, we got to tell them, right? Okay. We're, we're doing a two-parter here. This story is a little bit longer than our normal fare here on the show, so we decided to split it up in two so that it actually makes it out in some kind of a timely fashion, really. Uh, the story is called Ship of Fools, and the author is David Farland, who you might have heard of before. David Farland has been writing for a, a while. He's, uh, I guess, most well-known for his Rune Lords series. But he's written a lot of other stuff, and he's written under other names as well. His, his, uh, he's also known as Dave Wolverton. If you've ever read a story by him, he, that's the same guy as David Farland. Warning, the spoilers! Oh, was that a secret? Until no, you actually, blew? I don't think it was. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but uh, he, he mostly goes by David Farland now. He's, he's, he's given up the Wolverton thing. I think he's even converting like old stories that he published as Wolverton over now to Farland just to, you know, just to keep things straight. All right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, David Farland is the author. We were at a comic book convention. A, I guess the, I mean, you call them comic book conventions, but it was like a media convention, really, because there's everything at these things, you know, it's movies and TV and books and comics and everything else and so we were there and we we met I, him i believe they call those a geek together oh okay i like that uh <laughs> we were at a geek together and uh we were just talking to him he was on the floor he had a booth there and we talked to him about uh writing classes that he does and and all sorts of stuff because you know we're aspiring novelists he's a actual novelist and uh, we were kind of trying to pick his brain for whatever we could get, I guess. And then when we were done, I thought, you know what? I wonder if we could get a story from him. So I asked him. I told him about the show and asked him if we could possibly get a, a story from him. And he seemed into it, excited and, and interested. And, and uh, this is the result. So, yeah, here's the first part of the story, the first half. We'll give that to you now, and uh, and then we'll be back. We'll talk a little bit, and then uh, we'll go our way, I guess, and you can come back next time for the second half of the story. So enjoy. Ship of Fools by David Farland Snow-laden pines huddled beneath their white burdens at the margin of the road and for a moment, the ship of fools halted as it crested a hill. Its hull was painted a merry yellow, a bitter breeze played in sails of red silk. A painted wooden prow, facing backward, showed a fool dressed in motley, wearing a comic frown, as if afraid he might run aground. From a distance, the ship would have seemed to be sailing backward through the snow. Whoa! erstwhile called to the gray draft horse that pulled the ship. The vessel had been hoisted up on axles, of course, and turned into a wagon. But every time that it rolled through a town, rustics would gape and point. Inns and homes would empty as spectators gawked. Erstwhile liked that. The bigger the crowd, the more he got paid. Castle Crichton loomed ahead, perched upon a steep crag. Walls rose up, gray and oppressive, with merlins like rotten teeth. A dozen tall towers ascended in great spires, black spears aimed at the heavens. Tiny soldiers marched along its wall like toys in bright red cuirasses. No peaceful lord needed so many soldiers. A wretched city squatted in its shadow. Squalid houses and cheap wooden shops leaned at odd angles, as if wondering where to fall. 
Tis a sin that good trees died to create such a monstrosity. Erstwhile thought. He liked trees, but preferred them alive and breathing. Houses were not for him. The boughs of a living pine were roof enough. Clouds lowered above the castle, gray and threatening snow. Yet there was something more disconcerting. Shadows moved among them, gray-green, with bat-like wings that flapped slowly. The creatures had great long necks. Baron Blunder, lend me use of your eyes. As a satyr, erstwhile had the golden eyes of a goat, with a long black horizontal slit for a pupil. He saw well to the side, but he could not focus at long distances. He raised a hand to the base of the dark horns that rose from his brow, twisting as they swept back overhead, and shaded his eyes as he peered above the castle. His nostrils flared as if to catch some elusive scent in the snow. The land had the steel smell of ice. Baron Blunder, a fat giant in his forties, raised his head up through the hatch of the Ship of Fools. His face was pale as the snow, his jowls as massive as those of a bulldog. Baron Blunder had the look of a lackwit, but it was all for show. There above the castle, erstwhile asked. Over the topmost tower. Uh, is there something in the clouds? Dream dragons, Blunder offered. Nor but phantasms. Prince Crichton is a pompous git if the sayings be true. Thought you said he was perverse, erstwhile corrected. Not pompous. It's both. It's an unnatural union, not unlike yourself. Erstwhile was the last of the satyrs. He didn't see himself as anything but human. Yet every day, he was reminded that he was something less. I want to see. Amelie cried from inside the ship. She flung open the side door, her pretty young face so pale and free of blemish it seemed translucent. Her dark brown tresses hinted at flame. Erstwhile's heart skipped. Stay hidden, he hissed. But it was too late. She'd already popped her head out, despite the warnings. No one was near in the woods, and perhaps it didn't matter. Yet, at just that instant, a dream dragon dropped below the clouds and glared at them. A monstrous creature, ancient and rancid, ragged flesh stripped away from it in tatters, eyes blind and roomy. It could have been beautiful, a work of art. It was created from nothing more than dreams, after all. But this was not something born from a summer's fancy. Only a monstrosity, ripped from a nightmare. A man would have to study evil for long hours to create such a specter. Its gaze veered toward the ship of fools, fixed on Amelie like a rat speared to the floor, and then the dragon lifted back into the clouds. Could such a monstrosity really see them? Erstwhile chewed his lip. Probably not, he decided. He was a tough creature, yet right now he felt tiny and helpless. Crichton was evil. He liked to hunt young women. He stripped them naked first, Those that got away lived to tell the tale. Those who did not, no one ever learned their fate. He hunted girls who had been accused of crimes, petty theft, lewd behavior, gossiping, but only the pretty ones. It wasn't fair, but when were lords ever fair? And who would dare stand against Crichton? Need had driven the three here, like a teamster with a sharp whip. Ever since the highwaymen had robbed them last summer, Erstwhile had felt drawn to this place. In a time of war, a jester's arts were needed more than ever, yet widows and orphans had no coin to pay for entertainment, and in town markets where he once had earned good gold, now he only earned the gratitude of impoverished folks. Crichton's gold had drawn them. Rumor on the road said he'd pay 1,000 guldars this night to the fools that pleased him the best. Now, here erstwhile was, looking up at Crichton's castle. Crichton the Huntsman. Crichton Bloodfist. The Dark Prince. Back in the ship, Amelie, erstwhile warned. Crichton has an unsavory taste for pretty girls.
the ship of fools stopped in an inn at the base of the city. A crowd gathered to look, just as the snow began to swirl from the sky in great wet flakes. Erstwhile sat on the buckboard and played his lute for the crowd while Baron Blunder bought dinner at an inn. He soon came back with a gangrel of a chicken, along with buttered parsnips, stewed plums, and hard dark bread. He brought a keg of apple cider, and they retired into the ship to eat. As they entered the ship, some townsmen peered in the doorway. Ooh, there's a tasty tart, he called. Erstwhile slammed the door shut behind him, shaken. A dream dragon might not be able to see, but now a villager had seen Amelie. Would he report it? Did the prince pay for news of pretty girls? Dark was falling fast, so Amelie lit a small lantern made of bloodshot glass. She ate little, nibbling a roll. Baron Blunder, on the other hand, shoved food down his gullet as fast as possible. All were nervously silent as they considered the evening's performance. You'll do well, Amelie predicted. After six weeks of teaching him to sing in the prince's native Dangolian tongue, she had no more advice to give him. She only stared down at her role as if gazing into the eternities. Sure, said Baron Blunder with a smack of his lips. He always does well. He'll win the prince's purse. Win or lose matters little, <clears throat> erstwhile said. I'm more worried about you, Amelie. She was an outlaw, after all. My parents fled years ago, she objected. He's forgotten by now. She didn't seem frightened enough. Perhaps it was her youth. She would not say how old she was. Thirteen, fourteen, but she was too young to understand the ways of princes. Cryden would never forget a traitor's family. <laughs> Baron Blunder quickly finished eating and said, Best hurry on, don't you think? Castle gates close at dusk. Aye, Erstwhile agreed. You drive us in? Mm. Blunder grunted and lunged out the ship's door, then climbed up into the driver's seat. With a click of the tongue, he jolted the horses into motion. As the vessel rattled and rolled, Erstwhile peered hard at Emily. She was a quiet girl who seldom showed emotion, and he could not read her now. Her face, lit by the lantern, seemed surreal. In only moments, Baron Blunder tapped the top of the vessel twice. They were nearing the guardhouse. Remember, Erstwhile said, Stay hidden. There will be soldiers about. The ship can't be seen pitching or moving. The guards might try to take a peek inside, so keep hidden. We should be done by third watch, for good or ill. I'll keep still, she said. He worried, though. Emily had a fondness for taking long walks in the darkness, to enjoy the light of the moon. With that, she climbed into a trunk that Baron Blunder often used as a stool. The clothes and props that were normally stored there had been shifted elsewhere in the cabin. Emily folded herself in. Erstwhile went to her, held her hand, and peered into her sapphire blue eyes. Her hand felt cold on this cold winter's day. I love you, she said. I wish... His heart stammered before it caught a beat. She'd never said that she loved him before. He was older than her, of course, nearly twenty. He didn't quite know what she meant by love. As if to confirm her feelings, she leaned up and kissed him. He felt stunned. I wish... Emily said... I wish I was a satyr. Even her lips were cold, and a chill rushed over him. He felt it a portent. Erstwhile smiled sadly. He'd never felt loved. Ah, child, he said. Be glad that you're human. There's no place for my kind in your world. He pushed her down into the chest. He heard a guard outside call, Halt! Baron Blunder mumbled loudly as the ship drew to a stop. Erstwhile pushed Amelie into the chest and applied a heavy padlock. He climbed atop it and sat, just as guards threw open the door. Curious faces peered in. Boo, Erstwhile said. The guards' eyes grew round. 
erstwhile plucked the last flesh from the bones of his chicken, gave the guards a bored stare. They were so shocked, they fell back from the door and slammed it shut. That night, the solstice feast was already underway as erstwhile and Baron Blunder made their way into the servant antechamber. There was no merry hearth in the huge room, only frost creeping over the threshold from outside. There were not even the faded tapestries that one would expect to hold in the heat, only cobwebs adorning the bare stone corners of the hall. Apparently, in Crichton's realm, servants were treated no better than cattle. Three hundred bards and fools had gathered for the competition. Fear and anticipation filled the room. He saw it on the faces of black-skinned acrobats from Mansuria, dressed in jaguar furs. <coughs> One pretty young gypsy woman wearing silks was emptying her stomach in a corner, a victim of butterflies. Performers had traveled hundreds of leagues for a chance at tonight's reward. Erstwhile himself had spent weeks on the road and now was penniless and far from home. He didn't just want to win, he needed it, <laughs> ached for it. Erstwhile was a fair acrobat and could dance with the best of them. As a satyr, he would arouse a sense of wonder and curiosity, if not fear. All of that worked in his favor, made his acts memorable. But to win a thousand guldars, he needed more than spectacle. Singing and the lute were his strongest skills. He had a voice as mellow as honeyed wine, and his throaty vibrato would haunt an audience. Yet, for his songs to strike hard, they needed to be sung in the tongue of his audience. So Amelie had taught him. He wished now that he'd never met her. He hoped she was safe. She was still hidden in the ship of fools, parked on a great roundabout at the servant's entrance. She'd promised to be still, but there were two guards strutting about, men with hawkish faces and searching eyes. Outside, snow was tumbling through night skies. Erstwhile brushed it from his shoulders and pulled back the hood of his red great cloak, exposed his horns. People gasped. <gasps> All eyes turned to him. He doffed the cloak, hung it on a peg. People whispered his name. He peered through a curtain. His rivals, the maidens of Mansur, sang a haunting tune to shrill pipes, while two beauties danced about the room, crystalline snowflakes ever falling. Tough competition. Their beauty was ethereal, their voices sublime and more than one of them would sleep with the prince for a chance at the reward. Erstwhile went to a corner and began to tune his lute when one of Crichton's lackeys, an aide to the chamberlain, told him brusquely, You, this a haunt. You're next. It was always that way. He was a curiosity, and everyone was eager to see him. But he wanted time to study the situation. Winning a competition required an understanding of the lay of the land. Wait, Erstwhile said. I need some help, friend. The aide, a teen with a pimpled face, drew near. His breath smelled of wine. His mousy hair looked like hay. The boy kindly switched to Taldagian, a tongue common among traders. Need help with props? I need to know who in the room is out of favor with his majesty. The teen got a sly look, and Erstwhile suspected that the boy was about to mislead him. There's a pretty tip in it for you, if this turns out well. The table farthest from his majesty, a red priest by the name of Typhos. You'll know him by the scar. He made a slash across his nose. Erstwhile grinned. The table farthest from the lord was oft left for those out of favor. To have a victim for his jests, and a red priest at that, was gratifying. Baron Blunder lumbered across the room with a bundle of juggling pins. The aide pulled back a red curtain, and the fools entered. Prince Crichton's feasting hall was enormous. Sconces by the thousands along the walls lit the room. 
each was made from a skull, cunningly chiseled so that flickering candles glowed inside. Others were set as footlights for the actors. Flames danced within them like serpents' tongues. Vanquished enemies? Baron Blunder murmured. But they could not have all been enemies. Yes, there were crystal goblin skulls among them with their sharp canines, and the broad skulls of giants out of the Gwalin Hills. But some among the human skulls were so small they had to have been taken from children. A man who collects skulls will covet mine, erstwhile thought. There had been that one lord five years back who had tried to take it. Have no fears, erstwhile whispered lightly. We're under protection of the guild. The Bard's Guild was a fellowship of performers, jesters, musicians, acrobats. Guild members protected one another. Any lord who harmed a guilder would earn retribution. Entertainers would quit coming to his realm, or in extreme cases, might subject him to ridicule from afar. Puppeteers might show him as a buffoon, or bards might put his failings to song. On three sides of the room, enormous hearths were laid out. A wagon could have parked inside one. Smoke lingered in the air, a blue haze that smelled of rare sandalwood. Erstwhile strode forward, his small hooves clacking on the floor. Gasps arose from the crowd. Onlookers fell silent or began to whisper. What is that? (gasps) At the Lord's table, a feast was laid out, whole swans and platters of bread, venison pies and sweet rolls, mushrooms stuffed with garlic and rye crackers, oranges from the southern lands, and the last of the year's good apples baked into tarts, pitchers of ale, flagons of dark amethyst wine. Nostrils flared. A deep hunger stirred in erstwhile. His kind could not resist wine. The floor was of polished marble, a deep red in color with turquoise veins, a pentagram made of silver and encircled by copper marked off the central floor, as if Crichton hoped to summon a pack of demons. No less than two hundred lords and their ladies were in attendance, gaily dressed. The ladies all wore pointed caps that streamed peacock feathers and taffeta and wore brightly colored dresses of rose or sapphire that lifted their bosoms. The men wore leggings and tunics in shades of crimson and ebony, embroidered with threads of gold. Prince Crichton perched upon a pedestal rather than a normal table, as if he were looking down in judgment from above. His face was cowled in a red robe, so that erstwhile could not discern his features at all. Only a pale and pointy nose. He clapped his hands. Pleasure me. Erstwhile glanced back at Baron Blunder for ideas. It would have been simpler if the prince had called for a song, or asked for a jest. Instead, he left it to the entertainers. A song. Erstwhile said, and he raised his lute, began to pluck the strings. No! An angry voice called. It was the red priest, Typhos, eyes blazing. Not his kind, the priest said. He seeks to enchant you all. Beware! Erstwhile fought for control. It was the red priests that had killed his people, murdered them in the night for their supposed sins. That was their way. They'd purify the earth by washing the sinners in their own life's blood. I know no magic, erstwhile said. I have no power unless you find my songs enchanting. Kill the creature, the priest cried, rising from his chair. But those nearby pulled him back down into place, calling for him to shush. Prince Crichton merely nodded, a sign for erstwhile to play. He opened with a soft tune. Dancing Among Moon Shadows. The song was the stuff of legend, for the proper fingering required an exceptionally rare degree of virtuosity. He sang it now in Dangolian, and the hearts of the locals melted. The song was dark and haunting, 
like cloud shadows on a summer night, and began with sounds like wind sliding through trees and the serenade of crickets. As he played, erstwhile whistled the tune of nightingales so low, it came as if from a dream, and thus he began to play and swirl in dance. His hooves slid across the marble floor, and the lords and ladies fell quiet, as if under a spell. Soon, rain began to fall in the song, big liquid drops that sounded with the plucks of his strings, then began to skitter over stones, a rolling rollick that set him to frolicking. His hooves clattered upon the marble floor like hailstones falling, and Baron Blunder began to beat a big drum, the flash of lightning. People cheered as he swirled, dancing and playing. Many stood with mouths agape, for they had never seen an artist become one with the music in such a manner. There is a reason why it was said that satyrs were in league with the devil. That fear led to the deaths of erstwhile's parents and village, all wiped out in a single night. People began to clap in time, and his small hooves slid over stone as if he skated upon ice, gliding effortlessly in a surreal splendor. The room was in an uproar as the song reached its crescendo. But he was not ready to let the crowd go yet, not while he had them by their throats. With a flourish, he struck a transition into a new song, one of his own making, and he began to sing. Hey, no die diddly, hey die diddly, yay. The time has come for lute and drum to spirit us away. Though erstwhile looked as if he had the legs of a goat, the truth was that they had the strength of a heart. And so he now did something that no human acrobat could manage. He leapt backward into the air and did a quadruple somersault, landing with a clatter onto the table, right in front of Typhos. As he did, he reached into a small pouch that he wore around his belly, pulled out a handful of deer poop, small round pellets, and tossed them down. It all happened so fast that even those closest to the priest did not see it. To the observer, it appeared as if erstwhile had landed so hard, he'd pooped. The dry round pellets bounced on the table, falling onto the platter of cooked swan, rolling onto guests, plopping into wine goblets. The priest's eyes blazed, and he threw himself backward with such force that his chair clattered to the floor. Women nearby shouted, one baron rose up and looked as if he'd pull his dagger. But all around the room, others guffawed at the priest's expense. Erstwhile glanced at Prince Crichton from the corner of his eye. The prince shook with mirth. Pardon me, Erstwhile told Typhos with mock sheepishness. Nerves. Then he danced on the table, kicking over goblets, shoving platters aside. The priest went red. Baron Blunder shouted, Here now, what is that creature? Is it human? Is it a goat? That was the question everyone asked when they saw Erstwhile, and so he danced nimbly over the Lord's tables. Women stared at his privates and giggled. Bold men laughed out loud. He was all goat in the nether regions and wore nothing but his fur. From a distance, it almost looked as if he wore animal hides for trousers. As he sashayed about, he wagged his tail in time with the music. He was just warming up the crowd for some of Baron Blunder's comic juggling tricks when Prince Crichton spoke. The sound did not come from one place. Instead, it rose like the snarl of distant thunder and began to crackle. The language was more like the hiss of a snake than anything human. Erstwhile was struck with an unnatural fear, for the words made his very bones rattle. He wanted to answer with his whole soul, but could not understand the question. The crowd hushed. Prince Crichton reached out with a bony finger, made the come-hither gesture. Erstwhile's hooves were too frightened to move. His hips merely quivered. But he was drawn across the room, like iron to a lodestone, and found his hooves skating over the marble floor until he stopped in the midst of the pentagram. 
the Dark Prince hissed his question again, and still Erstwhile could not understand. A third time the hissing came, rushing forth like waves upon a shore. Suddenly, he understood. Where is the girl? The sheep of fools carried three. A giant, a demon, and a sweet young girl. Erstwhile knew that they had been caught. She grew sick, he said, mustering his courage. We had to leave her behind days ago. He peered up at the cowled face, trying to discern whether the prince believed him. The prince nodded, as if he understood, then pointed to the door. The doors yanked inward with a groan, the hinges twisting with powerful force. There stood Amelie, in a pale blue dress that seemed to be torn from the sky of a lost summer. Her face was slack, her eyes blank, as if she walked in her sleep. A pair of burly guards held her. Erstwhile had been caught in a lie he knew. Ah, there is the girl you were seeking, he said, as if he'd just discovered her. She seems to be much recovered. Again, Crichton hissed. Emily slid across the floor on unwilling feet until she landed next to Erstwhile. Tell me everything. Crichton demanded in his serpent's voice. He pointed a bony finger down at the girl, and a green flame spouted from her forehead. Ghostly plumes formed, half fog and half fire, swirling in a tempest, as if all of her dreams of green fields and all of her hopes and longings broke out as one. The prince opened his mouth, a vast black cavernous mouth, and the green fog swirled up into it. Suddenly his eyes blazed within the hood, a cold, piercing light. I shall have her, he whispered, his voice seeming to come from everywhere and nowhere. It circled, hissing in dark corners, then lashed from the opposite direction. Wait, Erstwhile begged. Please. She is an outlaw, Crichton said, child to my enemies. He reached down toward her, and Amelie began to surge into the air, rising toward him like a dying ember rising into the night. Erstwhile had never seen such powers. No, Baron Blunder shouted, distracting the prince. Amelie fell, a poppet whose strings had been cut. No, the prince simpered. Guards lunged, grabbed Baron Blunder. He was huge, but not strong. Three guards pulled him down and back, dragging him in a chokehold. No, erstwhile urged. Emily had done nothing. There had to be some justice in the world. Erstwhile knelt above Emily. Please, oh great prince, do her no harm. She was but a child when her parents were outlawed. Take me instead. There were gasps from some of the ladies in the crowd. Shock from some as they imagined a scandalous relationship that Erstwhile might have had with Amelie. Approval from others at a noble offer. Prince Crichton glared down. Erstwhile could not see his face, but the prince's eyes seemed to bore through him. What would I do with you? He asked, the words hissing and snapping in far corners. My head, Erstwhile said lightly. It has served me well all of my life, and it would serve you well. I need no counsel, the prince replied. The fools in my court give counsel enough. Then use it for a sconce, Erstwhile said. Imagine... With my horns, it would be the jewel of your collection. He raised his hands in an expansive gesture, and the glowing eyes of the dead seemed to peer down. Erstwhile reached up, stroked his own horn, as if polishing it. <laughs> Prince Crichton laughed, 
and suddenly it seemed that a spell was broken. It was not the portentous laugh of a demon, the distant snarl of a dragon. It was the laugh of a commoner, of a peasant at an inn, enjoying a mug of ale with friends, after he has heard a good jest. A fine offer, Crichton said. As noble as I have ever heard. Such nobleness should be honored. You win, Sater. The thousand golden guilders shall be yours. No man that I have seen has ever matched your skill with the loot, and that leap was stupendous, though I find your sense of humor to be a bit coarse. Erstwhile cocked his head and wondered, had this all been an act? Had the prince simply sought to unman the troops that played before him? No, it couldn't be. Erstwhile had heard too many dark tales, yet he wanted to trust his luck. The prince reached down, took a golden goblet from the pedestal, and a servant raced forward with a crystalline carafe and poured a deep red wine. This goblet has been in my family for six hundred years, the prince said. The weight of the gold alone is worth more than a thousand guldars. He stood and climbed down from the pedestal, then leaned down to hand the golden goblet to Erstwhile. Before he did, he raised it in the air. A toast to the greatest fool in all the land! Huzzah! 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 The lords and ladies shouted, raising and draining their own mugs. Huzzah! 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 Erstwhile saw the prince's face then, black eyes filled with madness, too full of light, a small black beard over a manly chin, a leering grin. There was an expression on that face that Erstwhile had never seen before. Hunger? Rage? The prince lowered the mug to the satyr's lips. Erstwhile dared not refuse. The wine was swirling in the cup, raging in a torrent, a tornado funneling down into an invisible drain. It was as dark as blood. He gingerly took a sip. It was the sweetest wine that had ever touched his lips, made from summer-ripe cherries. Wine does not affect satyrs the way it does humans. It does not absorb so slowly into the body. Instead, the liquor slammed into his brain, pounding like a hammer. Not only was the wine sweet, it was stronger than anything he'd ever tasted. In an instant, he was swirling, struggling to keep up on his feet. People laughed and pointed. Look at the goat, man! A woman scorned. Erstwhile grinned at her, struggling to keep from falling. A song! Someone shouted, and Erstwhile took up his lute and began to play. He capered about the room, spinning as the wine had spun, weaving and playing, lost in song, and the crowd began to clap. He sang, My mother was a milkmaid, my da a billy goat, and on the night that I was born they took me for a moon calf and threw me in the moat. Hey, no, die diddly, hey, die diddly, yay. The time has come for wine and drum to bear us all away. Erstwhile danced as the people clapped. He searched the room for barren blunder, but all he could see was grinning skulls on the wall and flickering orbs. He peered about for Emily, but smoke stung his eyes and he stumbled. Had to watch his feet. And in moments, he forgot where he was. Lost in... Song. He woke in the dead of night. He did not wake all at once. First, he became aware of a scraping and wondered what it was. But his mind was groggy and he went back to sleep. Moments after, he felt a jolt and heard scraping again. Something had him by the leg. He felt a tug. Someone was pulling him by the left hoof. Outside. Through the snow. Strong drink does not affect satyrs the way that it does humans. He noted what was happening, but the wine had so dulled his senses that he could not react. He merely fell back into a stupor. Get the door, someone said in a gruff voice. 
and he was pulled along through a doorway. He managed to open his eyes a slit. A burly soldier in chainmail had him by the foot. The chamberlain's aide carried a torch leading the way. They entered a strange room that smelled of copper. Leave him, the soldier said, dropping erstwhile. The fat soldier wiped sweat from his brow with the back of his sleeve. The aide had carried the torch to the far door and stood staring at it. Shall I fetch the butcher? the lad asked. His voice sounded buoyant, jolly. Erstwhile suddenly realized that something was very amiss. Wake up, his senses warned. Wake up! But his muscles wouldn't move. So he continued breathing steadily, as if he were fast asleep, and closed his eyes. Don't rouse him, the soldier said. The chamberlain's aide suggested, oh, They should tie the creatures in. That's the aide who helped me, erstwhile thought. When I needed to know who was out of favor. He felt so betrayed. Tough hands grasped erstwhile's wrists, and rope cut into them. Both men squatted over erstwhile, and he wished that he had a knife. But he had not been able to carry any weapons into Crichton's hall. He nearly moaned when he realized that he no longer even had his goblet. Where is Hamily? He wondered. And Baron Blunder. The soldier finished tying his wrists, then went to erstwhile's legs. Afterward, he grunted and rose. The door scraped the floor as they opened it. A chill air blasted into the room, then they were gone. Outside, the chamberlain's aide asked cheerfully, What do you suppose satire tastes like? <laughs> the soldier laughed. Sort of like goat, he said. With maybe a bit of food thrown in. Erstwhile lay still as their footsteps receded, crunching over ice-covered snow. He knew this place now. The coppery scent he detected was blood. Blood so thick that it had seeped into the dirt floor. He was at the shambles, the kill shed, where the king's butcher slaughtered animals. He couldn't imagine that someone would want to eat him. It seemed so unnatural. But then he remembered that look in Crichton's eyes, the rage and hunger, and realized what it meant. Erstwhile stilled his heart, found his throat feeling tight and dry. Satyrs get drunk more quickly than humans do, but the effects wear off more quickly, too. He pulled hard on the cords that bound him. They were made of leather by the feel of them, stiff and icy. Human feet are easy to tie because they are so large. Not so with Erstwhile's sharp little hooves. He kicked at the rope and in seconds struggled free of his bonds, stumbled to his feet. Then he pulled at his hands. As a satyr, he was stronger than a human. His training as an acrobat made him stronger still. Now he strained. The friction warmed the cords. With every twist and pull, the leather stretched. In moments, he broke free. He opened the door and stood looking out. The chill air had teeth as sharp as wolf's cubs. A thick fog covered everything as dense as gruel. Yet the full moon provided a glum light. A dog was barking at the castle gates, and in the distance he could hear horns blowing. Not the deep throaty call of war horns, but the high song of hunting horns. No, it isn't a dog barking at the castle gates, he decided. It is several dogs, and they are miles away. It is a hunting party out in the snow and moonlight. Emily. He imagined her running through the cold night, barefoot and naked, while Crichton chased her upon his charger with a boar's spear in hand, dogs yapping wildly on her trail. It would not be a fair hunt in the snow. She would not be able to escape, not with her footprints providing a clear trail. She would not be able to outrun him for long before the cold took her. Yet what could Erstwhile do? The castle gates would be closed, the drawbridge up. With his horns and hooves, he could not just sneak out, even in this fog. Urgency swept through him. He wanted to help Amelie. He needed to be sure that Baron Blunder was alive. He wanted vengeance. 
He could not do everything at once. Amelie and the prince were far away, but he didn't know where Baron Blunder might be. He decided to check the Great Hall. Everybody, welcome back. Uh, that was the first part, the first half of the story, Ship of Fools. Uh, we've got a cast list. Nobody knew that gets introduced later, right? No, so it's an this, equal opportunity offender. This cast list will do for both halves, although we'll probably repeat it next time around too anyways. We'll be snarkier next time. Yes. No, that's probably not possible. Uh, so Big Anklevich was uh, the narrator, and he did a fine job. I think I was also the the bad guy, Crichton, I want to say his name was. Okay. Were you Crichton? That's cool. The evil mastermind. And Rish Outfield was our lead character, the satyr. Graham. That is right, right? That's how you say that name. Graham. <laughs> Graham Dunlop guested on our show doing the voice of the giant. Renee Chambliss. Was the uh, pretty maid, and, and that leaves only one and that special was guest. Only one special guest who was played by Ben Gifford, who j basically just did many various voices. He was like the voice of a guard and the voice of a townsperson, and he was one of the people who shouted "Huzzah!" <laughs> and one of the people who went. <gasps> And okay. so on and so forth. He had a lot of little bits in this half, and he'll have a lot more little bits in the next half. Good stuff. All around. Uh, so that was our cast. Yeah. So where do you want to go from here? Anywhere in particular? I, I don't imagine we all have a lot to say, because it's just the first half of the story. Uh, it just took so long to produce what you heard even with cutting corners like asking ben gifford to do all of the miscellaneous characters that big and i hadn't done it still just took a long long time and i realized you know the thing's not going to get done until october or so unless i just stop at some point and then go back and and do a music pass and then go back and do a sound effects pass and all that stuff just up to a certain point and then i can tackle the rest of the story then, you know, it's just too exhausting to go all the... I mean, I, we're talking o an over an hour long story with multiple characters and sound effects and music and a song. And, Which I'm sure that had to be difficult. Uh, hi diddly, hi diddly, hey. Yes. It was just sort of an arbitrary, okay, here's where I'm going to stop. I feel like this is a good moment of, you know, transition or, or whatever you want to call it. You know, cliffhanger moment. I'm just, supposed to bitch at you about this, and then you were going to give me the middle finger Yeah. Uh, afterwards. Do you still want to do that? I do remember that we were going to stop one scene earlier, I we, thought. We were never going to stop, just just so you know. But that's that's not the middle finger. I, 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 I We discussed this, I thought, and I thought, yeah, we could totally split it. It would be a perfect spot. It could. And then when I was listening to your version of it, I thought, oh, it'll be just like the Plague Birds two-parter, where basically our character is dead. And we say, okay, we'll be back with the next half. And everybody goes, what? The character's dead. There can't be another half. But, you know, whatever. It's close. It's more or less the same thing. And you got to pick somewhere. At least, I guess, in this, the, the, the scene that you chose, we've got like, okay... Everything has gone bad, and now he's going to go and do something to change his fortunes. But yeah, it, it is interesting. I thought it was fun to hear all the stuff that you did. You did a lot of sound effects, a lot of... I mean, you had clopping horse hooves and stuff like that, which I probably, if I'd done it myself, I might have just said, no, I'm not doing those. I'm skipping that part. Yeah, the, too the much. actual dance of the satyr... Foley was like the last straw. She was like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, you, but you and I, we, we dealt with this years ago when you 
became way more ambitious for your stomach and you're just like, wow, holy cow, look at all the sound effects that I've put in this episode. But now I've raised the bar to the point where I, I am I expected to put this much into every episode? Oh, geez. Just the thought of it was exhausting. And so, <laughs> but, but here, it's just a little thing. I, I felt like this was a freaking great story and it deserved as much as I could bring to it. All of my talents that, that I could bring to the, the table. I, and Wolverton is not a nobody. He's got a, a Hugo nomination. He's got a Nebula nomination. I don't know if he's got a Parsec nomination. So, hey, you know, hey. Well, that's but, to come. I mean, from this, he <laughs> will have a Parsec nomination. <laughs> Agreed. I forgot. <laughs> but I, it's just like somebody has actually heard of this guy. You know, yeah, He wrote he's... Courtship of Princess Leia, which is a book that Star Wars fans have read. He I just, won the Writers of the Future contest. He won it. That's right. He definitely is somebody that people have heard of before. And because of that, I wanted to put my best foot forward. Right. And so I, 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 I tried to, uh, well, I, you know, I tried to do what nobody else would do. You know what I mean? It's like only the Dune Steve would do this on the, on the story, the, the, the song kind of thing. Right. And anyway. He, yeah, the, the song thing, it's, I mean, it makes me remember back when uh, the show was relatively new. We did a story called Mermaid Beach. And in that story, there was the song that the little girl keeps singing uh, again and again. It's just a, it's a little childhood song. It's like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or something, but it's about fish. And yeah, you came up with a tune for the song, and we, we had to sit and coach my daughter on how to sing this song, and we sang it, I don't I swear, it must have been a hundred times. <laughs> I remember just sitting there going over and over and over and over and over again with it. It's a lot of work to to do a song. I remember when he sent us the story, and I read it through, and I, I was just like, oh, boy, it's got a song in here. And Luckily, you were all gung-ho to be the producer of the thing, so I went ahead and let you because I did not want to have to deal with that. But also, I think you're probably more musically uh, performance anyways inclined than I am. You're... You're down with coming up with a tune and putting all this stuff together, whereas in my mind, I'm just like, oh, I can listen to music. I'm totally happy to do that. <laughs> Making music? Yeah, I can sing something somebody else tells me to, but trying to put together a song is... <sighs> Sometimes there's just certain things where you look at it, and even though it, if you really did it, it might not be the the hardest thing you've ever imagined but just looking at anything oh no that's that's i can't no that's too hard i can't that's beyond what i could do i'm sorry you're gonna have to get somebody else for that well yeah the the, the something that we learned from brian lincoln is that you always want to challenge yourself with every production and do something that you've not done before or stretch yourself or i mean that, that that's something that i never really got with brian lincoln i'd be like why why would you why would you make it harder for yourself <laughs> than you have to do? And Brian's answer was, why not? Oh, snap. Yes, he used he just, my own words against just me. Just threw it back in your face. Um, yeah, with something like this, we're like, well, I want to make it special. And nobody else is going to do it. I mean, except for maybe Norm Sherman, if he, if, because he's, yeah, he's musically... He uh, is really musically inclined. He He's... I think before he even started his podcast, he would do all, you know, he, he did his, he his, does his songs song. and all that kind of stuff. And he had a CD Wrote ready to song. sell. He sang the same song. Yeah. And uh, and he would do all those songs as part of his podcast. If you donated a bunch of money, he would do a song for you and all that kind of stuff. So he's really musically inclined. And I think he went to college for music. And so yeah, I could see someone like Norm doing it. But beyond that... I mean, you you got to be generally a person that's a, a musical person. Well, well, maybe. you got to be able to put yourself out there. Nobody's ever going to buy a copy of the Seder song that I, I, I wrote. And uh, here's a preview for next episode. Renee Chambliss has a song in the second half of this production. I, basically, I just sent her an email and I said, here's the words. Just make up a tune for it to go. Do what I do. Kind of thing, which is just a, such a giant put upon thing. I mean, just to <laughs> what say, a hey, douche move. It is, there you go. That's a, it's a dick move. And I said, just just do this. And so Renee gets on there and she's like, okay, uh, here's 
uh, here's take one. And she just makes up a tune. And she's like, okay, so here's another tune. And I just like, wow, the amount of work that she was willing to do for free for us. Plus, now you didn't get to listen to her, her, her tape, I don't think. But she has to like warm up her voice and get used to the accent. And so she was just like quoting like Jane Eyre or it might have been, you know, some Jane Austen or some kind of thing doing like this monologue until she had the accent all where she wanted it to be mm-hmm. before she, and I was like, wow. And then she did these warm ups for the other accent for, you know, the, uh, the other characters that she wanted to do. And then after all that, after singing the song, after doing all the accents and, you know, and saying huzzah, which of course is hard. Huzzah. 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 Uh, she, oh, huzzah. That's right. <laughs> what? Hey, don't do that. She said, if you don't like any of these choices that I made or whatever, just let me know and I'll do it again. And I was just like, wow, holy cow. I felt guilty about that. I still feel guilty because she she gets paid to do the wow. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. She gets paid. Hey, you too. I was once like you. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> she, that ain't funny, man. Tone Loke is national hero. Is that a treasure? What? I can't remember what he uh, said. He, treasure. Oh, gosh. She gets paid to do audio, to do narrate audiobooks and, and all that stuff, and to just ask her, hey, would you do this insane amount of work for nothing, like we always ask you to do? It's just really cool. But, of course, anybody that's had Renee work on their podcast is better for it. Yeah, it's. I can understand where she's coming from, for having to warm up to an accent kind of thing. You don't seem to have that problem. You can drop from one to the other. I mean, you could have a conversation yourself with fake Sean Connery without having to edit it. Not everybody's that way. I'm not that way, I know. I remember when we originally read this story, just you and I sitting next to each other, I did the voice of the giant. And you had decided that everybody that was on the ship of fools that came from far away they were all going to be english accents and everybody that was in you know this country was all going to be like a german kind of an accent so, so they just obviously sounded like different yeah different nationalities countries or something kind of thing. yeah separated people and so i'd be reading in my normal voice and then i would do a line of the bad guy in his german accent and then i'd have to do the the giant in the British accent that I can't remember what it was because obviously it's not there anymore. So I can't refresh my memory, but yeah, I would recite a line from like Monty Python or something like that to get myself kind of into the giant. And then I would also have to uh, uh, get really (laughs) low. And I remember practicing, you know, saying a couple things just to get myself back to it so that I could pull the line off. And sometimes if I didn't do that, it would not sound right. And I would say something, I'm, oh wait, hold on a second, and then I'd be like, well, I was just sitting there, and a man came around, and I noticed there was 10 pounds missing. Or what, <laughs> something, I don't know. I don't remember what the line was for Monty Python that I would use. But uh, that helps sometimes, reciting Jane Eyre, or Monty Python, or whatever it is that helps you do the uh, the British accent, or the whatever it totally does and we all have our our tricks or or whatever it is to do we did a a story in like the first few months of the show and you were doing the voice of john reese davies as the king or something like that and so every time as you were about to start you'd go there are no dwarf women and then you you would go did you include that in the episode i wonder well i guess you would have edited the actual story yeah, I don't so know I, that I, we we at least talked about it. I don't know if we did uh, outtakes back in those days or not yet. It's, it's, oh, outtakes were probably a separate file that we would yeah, hide. Yeah, in those days. Uh, yes. Okay. I, I guess the that's a roundabout way of saying because Dave gave us a story that was a significant story. I wanted to do more with it than anybody else would, so that he could be like, "Hey, guys." Hey, honey, I want you to listen to this production of Ship of Fools that somebody did with my story. I mean, it's more than an actual audiobook would do with the story. It's a production, right? And and, and that's one of the things that has sunk the Doonstief Audio Fiction magazine <laughs> is that propensity to go all out and to get different voices and to do music and do songs and sound effects and foley. 
it just makes it impossible to create the show yeah, in the volume that we would have liked to put it out. It's the 90% size model of the Titanic in the giant pool in Mexico, <laughs> uh, basically, is what that is. Um, the thing that almost destroyed the show, that made it cost so much money that they had to get another film company in to distribute it. That's what that propensity tends to do. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure some people get frustrated with us that our show only comes out uh, much more sparingly than uh, other podcasts, which can come out weekly. And yeah, I think that's the reason why, is because we've established a certain level uh, that we have to reach before we're uh, willing to say, yes, I'll put the stamp on it. <laughs> I'll put that little spiral D onto this one now. <laughs> well, they're uh, not always going to be like this. They're not... I, I, I say that, and yet... You know, this is the newest episode we've done, and we've raised the bar. We don't know what's coming next, so we'll see that. Well, the second half of this story is coming next, so I I think it'll be at least right along the same bar. Well, luckily, Marshall Latham is producing the next half of the story, so pressure is off my back. (laughs) Anyhow, um, do you have anything more to say? Should we go our way? Um, Yeah, no, I don't want to say too much. Uh, we obviously can't analyze the story very much because we're only halfway through. We just talk about maybe the production and that kind of stuff. I really enjoyed all the the crowd scene stuff that you did because there was a lot of it, obviously. It, it cracked me up just to hear all the people, huzzah, huzzah. And, you know, you can tell some of them are both us or, you know, and I I heard Renee doing several different voices going, huzzah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, which crack, it just cracks me up a little. Well, she's like Carol Cleveland for us. Whenever <laughs> right. there's a part that we don't play. Yeah, there you go. Going back to Monty Python. But yeah, we'll, we'll let you go. Uh, we, won't, we won't talk too much more. And soon, as long as this is enough of an incentive to spur you forward, we'll have the second half. And then we'll have a much probably lengthier episode as we speak more on it. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah, thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll be back soon with the uh, second half of Ship of Fools. Thank you, David Farland, for uh, letting us do this story. And if any of you are considering donating to the Dune Steve, why not? <laughs> that's right. It's uh, easily available. Just click on the little PayPal link on the, on the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Have fun storming the castle. Ain't gonna work. Uh, it'd take a miracle. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Okay, we're going to leave it right where it is. I mean, you can bitch about it if you want to. Okay, but, uh, that, that's cool. You'll get a giant middle finger from me. But you, you know what? You're going to get one anyway, so yeah, we might as well that just... That is definitely true. I get one no matter what I say, so... Yeah, kind of like being a husband. <laughs> it's a lot like being a husband. Thanks. He I just... won the Writers of the Future contest. He won it, that's right. On my way to Eden or something like that. What was it called? On my way to Piccadilly, sir, on my way, as I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. It's a long way to Tipperary. Ma! We'll just cut that out. <laughs> yes, we'll cut it out, except for ma! Yeah, we'll leave that. We'll search a uh, ship of fools and see what we get with that. Oops. Ship only has one P, doesn't it? Well, if it's... John Wesley's ship who plays The Flash ah. in the 1990 show. That's, that was weird. Did it crash? Yeah, it just crashed on me as I was in the middle of typing the search. It doesn't like John Wesley's ship. If Barry Allen's father was in prison for murder, would he be allowed to be a, a policeman, uh, you know, on the police force? I think so. Because he didn't do anything, you know what I'm saying? Damn it.
crashed again? Just crashed again on me. I guess his foster father was a police detective, and so that makes it a wash, right? Something like that, yeah. I'm trying to remember if you li- you don't like Iris, or you don't like the actress who plays Iris, or you think she's hot. It was one of those three. I don't like Iris. I do think she's hot. I have nothing against the actress that plays her. On the panel, the flash panel, I, I, I thought she was remarkably attractive. I'm like, wow. Yeah, she's freaking gorgeous. She's unbelievably hot. Uh, you know, I see her and I think if she's that hot, I mean, I don't know, I guess there's lots of hot people out there, but why is she not on all sorts of uh, uh, shows? You know, she's so gorgeous. That must have come from... Is Graham Dunlop connected to escape artist somehow he is yeah he's one of the runners of of podcastle now what the did hell? it crash again no i went to click on it and it changed to something else right so i guess it's still searching and so right as i'm trying to click on it dad i i, I meant to click on the church website and gay porn came up I, I i don't know why it keeps doing this i don't know why there's months of search history that has gay porn on it either i yeah, it's just weird when that crap happens. You're like in the process of clicking and it goes, and it, you know, other things move. Or, yeah, the ads suddenly appear as you're trying to click on. I hate that so much. <laughs> you're about to click on something and then the ad appears and, you know, pushes what you were going to click on down and then you click all over the stupid ad and you're like, no. <laughs> yes. Oh, we sound so privileged. It ruined my day. I had to hit back. It's never that easy. I mean, you hit back, but then it takes a whole... I mean, I don't know. Maybe your data thing is better than mine, but mine kind of sucks. It takes a long time to download anything. And it is privileged, obviously, white person's problems or whatever, but I don't give a f***. Curasses? <laughs> Cure? Cure asses. Cure asses. Say She's got a great cure ass. Queer ass. Queer ass. Queer. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you don't say. Huzzah! 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 Oh, huzzah. I wish I had a chalupa, I'd eat one here with you. Everyone around me could have a bite or two. I love chalupas, do you love chalupas? Chalupas are good. I could have chalupas, I would want chalupas right here in the woods. We could have a chalupa party, everyone could come. You could come and you could come, but not Prince Cryden, because he is scum. I have all good authorities, scum. I don't know how to end the song, but chalupa's fun. There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.